Hi and welcome to week three of our online UWC sustainable development class. This week we will be focusing on sustainable agriculture and uh, we have with us uh, today Mike Johnston uh, who is uh, doing a PhD in organizational systems humane education um, and specifically as it relates to teaching sustainable development. So we have a great expert who really understands both and um, and how to best teach sustainable development and climate um, change issues in schools. Uh, so today uh, we're going to hear more uh, from Mike about how um, how systems uh, thinking works and uh, potentially also hear some uh, great case studies. Welcome, Mike. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm quite excited that there's a group of people around the world is interested in this kind of thinking. And uh, in my uh, doctoral work, what I am now researching is with a focus on understanding sustainability and with that understanding in employing the ideas of systems thinking, we as human beings will actually come up with better solutions for the issues that we face. So that's, that's my research and my work. Um, can you tell me, is it, is it possible for me to do a screen share? Does that... Is that okay for people to, if they want to view some things? Absolutely. Uh, so if you do want to do a screen share, on the left-hand side, uh, you have a green screen share button. Okay. And once you share this, I will confirm that everyone can see. Yes, uh, you can see. How are we looking? Uh, we also need a presentation. So if you can <laughs> click through to the presentation. All right, here we go. So uh, can you see that okay? Amazing. Yes, can see this. Amazingly, uh, thanks. Really great. So I'll give a little bit of background um, in terms of why I'm in this kind of work. Uh, I truly do believe that if we're going to create the sustainable future that we want, um, really we've got to focus on the possibility with focus on sus focusing on sustainability. Because I do find that people get overwhelmed uh, by the issues and they get kind of bogged down instead of looking at what's possible they look at all the issues and just get bogged down in the complexity. And uh, sustainable agriculture is a perfect example. Um, when you look at where I'm living right now in Singapore, uh, food security is one of the biggest issues uh, that's going on here. The amount of food that's actually grown uh, in country um, for the people of Singapore is less than 2% of the food that is consumed. So when you talk about sustainable agriculture, it's got so many directions that it can take. So the idea behind backcasting and looking at in 50 years, I want the world to be, uh, many times people look at the idea of, well, I'd like everybody to have access to food, water, all the basic needs. And so when we look at that, how is that going to be possible? What, what kinds of solutions could we possibly come up with? So the idea that when we look at sustainability and we look at agriculture, uh, the idea that the economy has existed, and this is debatable depending on what you define as the economy, for approximately 3,000 years. And beyond that 3,000 years, um, some kind of trade and barter and system of where uh, people get what they need uh, from others and don't produce it all themselves necessarily. And then the human society, actually about 150,000 years. Um, but actually, when you look at the nature aspect, we are talking 3.8 billion years. So I often start people's thinking on some of these major issues in terms of asking the questions about the order, the order to things. And I will also often guide people to the fact that sometimes... Um, doing this kind of work and most of the time it should just lead to good questions aren't necessarily the right answers there's no right and wrong so if we look at that in terms of the order of things uh, some things depend on each other so that nature depends on the society or society depends on the nature and both the society and the economy definitely depend on that nature so Yet when we look at some of the issues that we're reading about in the, in the press and whatnot, there's definitely a focus on the economy and it seems to be driving uh, the discussions in terms of society and in terms of nature. So for agriculture, 
uh, our most fundamental needs in terms of food consumption, um, we tend to also put in this order. And we tend to look at the economies that are produced um, by agriculture and for agriculture, and that fulfilling the needs of the humans, but don't tend to put nature at the base where, actually, if we're going to study the risks in agriculture, we need to study what, uh, what people depend on. And we depend on nature in order for those other things to exist. Um, it's an exciting time. It's a really exciting time, and I'll share this article uh, from the Business Harvard Review with people in terms of the age of innovation. It's an exciting time, especially for students who are in school and looking at where they're going to come out the other side of high school and university and the kinds of things that they're going to be doing because in the sixth wave that we're in right now in terms of sustainability and radical resource productivity, the, the systems that are involved in agriculture need to be understood. Um, in order to innovate these new and uh, more viable solutions. So I'll, I'll pass along that article. For me, this is where my motivation comes in. Those are my kids. And my motivation comes from just absolutely, it really is systems within systems within systems. And it's amazing. It's an amazing thing to both understand, but then also once we understand it, we're much more likely to make good decisions. An example in terms of agriculture would be if we're just serving the most immediate need to feed more people, then the decisions that you're going to make are not necessarily uh, in balance with the system's conditions. If you're looking at just focusing on GDP and you want to increase your productivity to boost your economy, again, you're not considering all the conditions you need to. But I'd take one step back because in terms of food, what we don't, what we don't have in this day and age, uh, um, especially in the urban settings, is we don't have a connection to where the products actually come from. So normally when I talk to students, and I, can't, I won't see people, they'll watch this later, but in terms of the people who are live right now, what I want you to think in your head is in looking at those six images, how many of them can you relate to a product uh, in your life uh, that you consume or that you use? And I did this in front of 800 educators uh, on the weekend on Saturday. And I asked them to put up both their hands and say, okay, I want you to show how many of these six pictures you could name. What, I'm going to come and chop your finger off if you're not right. So we wanted people just to not guess. What, what actually are these things? And the can average I try? Yeah, go ahead. Give it a shot. Uh, so I think that the first one is cocoa beans. Mm -hmm. uh, the second one is coffee. Yep. Uh, the second one is um, hay, as in like, you know, you produce like wheat and bread and stuff from it. Yep. Um, then the last one looks like some kind of mess, uh, but I'm not sure whether it's corn or something, just the lower part of corn. Yep. Um, the uh, lower one, I have absolutely no idea what it is, and then the uh, strange fruit, I also have no idea what it is. So right. top three I can relate to, but yeah. not the bottom. Yeah. And the average was, you're about dead on what the average was in the room, the average was between one and two of what 800 educators could name what it is. And so the point being for agriculture, and for our connection to the systems of food. I mean, when you talk uh, top left, when you talk about chocolate, I mean, major part of people's lives in a lot of places around the world. Coffee, you're right, being the top middle. Top, uh, the top right being um, rice. And uh, we, uh, food in its different forms in terms of where it comes from, and it depends on where you are around the world as well. Uh, bottom right being sugar. Bottom middle being rubber. And bottom left, I used at a teacher's conference in terms of showing them that actually if they had a beer at the social the night before, that's hops. That's where it actually comes from. So the point being, if there's a disconnection from the natural world, then what, what is it that we are, what kind of decisions are we going to make in grocery stores and we, when we make purchases 
that impact the whole system of growing. Because if, if we're willing to support a system that is not sustainable, whether it's knowingly or unknowingly, then we are just feeding that same system, which has actually got us into quite a bit of trouble. So then I ask people, okay, you put those two hands out again and see how you do in terms of how many of these six you can name. And usually the reaction that gets... Every in, single in a, one of them. Uh, of course. And in a, in a crowd of 800 people, it usually gets a reaction of, oh, they laugh, they're unsure, they're not sure how to feel about that, they're a little bit down about it. Um, but, I mean, that's our reality for food in terms of our connection to food. Um, if anybody wants to look up, I recommend looking up a guy in the UK. Um, he's, he's doing something called Project Wild Thing. And Project Wild Thing is about connecting people to nature. And he was in the business of marketing, making a lot of money, making a good living. And then he, when he watched his own children in terms of how they were reacting and how they were not connecting to their natural world, how they didn't even want to go outside, uh, he changed everything that he was doing and he became someone who was going to use his marketing skills to market nature. So take a look at Project Wild Thing. Uh, it's an interesting one. So I work for a nonprofit company called Compass Education and I'll provide the link to that for anybody who's interested. But the way that we talk about sustainability is in these four systems conditions. Nature, economy, society, and well-being. And it's probably not very different from the traditional Venn diagram of sustainability that a lot of people work with. Um, it was actually come up, um, it's been around for over 25 years and came from Atkinson Global, Alan Atkinson, who has written books uh, like Believing in Cassandra. Um, he wrote, uh, his latest one is just a 47-page book called Sustainability is for Everyone. And it's actually a great book uh, for people to read in terms of how to talk about sustainability. But work, um, with organizations to achieve sustainability, what we realize is people don't understand sustainability. They believe that sustainability is the green team. You know, it's creating a recycling program, which is part of it, but there's much more to it. So in terms of making decisions for agriculture and for growing and food production and transport and consumption and waste, we use this tool called the compass to map out these systems conditions. Because if we're trying to achieve sustainable in terms of nature, economy, society, and well-being. Now, the issue is, especially for agriculture, there's no right or wrong answer. You can't go to one extreme and be the complete tree hugger and say, no, you have to stop everything you're doing with this. You just can't do that. And you can't be the complete money grubber and say, no, this is all about profits and this is how this is going to work because you can see how that's going to impact the other uh, systems conditions. So when we look at agriculture, we could easily map out all the systems conditions for any given issue, including we could put um, the use of pesticides in the middle of that compass and say, okay, for the use of pesticides, what systems conditions, causes, and effects would you consider for nature? What would you consider for economy? What would you consider for society? What would you consider for well-being? And what it is, it's just a teaching, learning, and thinking tool to be able to actually map out the connections between all those systems conditions. Um, the reason that well-being is its own category is because this has increasingly become a bigger conversation globally to say, should we be measuring happiness and well-being? Should we be looking at that as the goal rather than exponential growth in economies? And for agriculture, that is a big question in terms of those systems conditions. What are we going to look at in terms of making decisions about how we grow our food, who has access to that food, how we consume that food, and food waste and everywhere that it goes from there? It's a big, big question. Because actually, for agriculture, Really what we're looking at, if we're going to define sustainability, let's just look at something in between too much and not enough, to put it very simply. So when we're trying to achieve this sustainability, it doesn't matter whether we're talking about the water cycle, and there's a reason that I show that in French. Because in the end of the day in schools, we see systems all the time and we're trying to understand systems. Uh, I do have a question in terms of 
curriculums in schools in terms of a language curriculum or a math curriculum of why are we not tackling these issues in French class and giving it context? Why are we not in math class using the data from our building for inputs and outputs of, say, food waste and using those real numbers to look into proportions, ratios, Poisson probabilities, statistics, whatever math you want to study and giving it an actual real context? Because in order to understand sustainability, you got to understand systems. And we see these systems all the time. I'm sure everybody who's listening uh, live right now and everybody who's watching this, you're familiar with systems all the time. But the interesting thing is, a lot of time you see them in science class, these types of systems. But actually, we see them all over the place. We just don't recognize them as systems, like political systems. Political systems act just like any other systems. We can understand these systems. And of course, there's the body that's an intricate system within system within system within systems that if you impact one or move one piece of that system then what's the result? Well, it depends. It depends on how that system works. Um, that's the purpose behind us using the compass tool. We look at all those systems conditions and actually try and map out what it means because actually for schools, schools are actually a system as well. And if you're going to look at the sustainability of a school, you better, you better look at the nature, economy, well-being, and society. And I haven't mapped these out in the appropriate places, but look at the things that are happening in the people, even, who are within schools. Is it the counselors who are responsible for the well-being? Is it the business managers who are responsible for the economy? But is, the, is it the business manager's only job to look after the money? Or should they be talking about it to the counselors? Should we engage the students? Should teachers be involved? Should parents be in the conversation? How do, we actually uh, how do we actually look at these systems to achieve greater sustainability? Simplicity is often just on the other side of complexity. I'm going to recommend that you, it may already be in your course um, viewing, but in terms of embracing the complexity, Eric Berlow does a TED Talk on embracing the complexity that's just over three minutes. And he does a beautiful job of explaining this systems map and the idea that actually if you're going to come up with solutions that are sustainable and actually mean something you need to map the system to find out where your best leverage point is and in terms of agriculture this is exactly what needs to be done so we can stop making decisions that we don't know what the unintended consequences are because actually when you look at the alternative to actually A, understanding sustainability, B, understanding systems and how to map systems to find leverage points, and then C, once you find those leverage points, creating good action plans to improve the human condition, and in our case we're talking um, agriculture, then what you get is you get unintended consequences. For example, in the 1950s, a classic uh, a classic example of a decision made by the World Health Organization because in Brunei, in Borneo, there was an outbreak of mosquitoes that were carrying uh, malaria. What they decided to do? Well, spray DDT to kill the mosquitoes. But actually what happened because they sprayed the DDT, people's roofs started to collapse in. But it actually wasn't the DDT that collapsed the roofs. It was the fact that they actually killed the bee and the wasp that regulated the caterpillar population that fed on the thatched roofs. Because actually once that was, once that population was um, decreased, the gecko population was in trouble. Once the gecko population was in trouble, the cat population was in trouble. Once the cat population went down, they had an increase in rats. Once the increase in rats took hold, they had typhus and bubonic plague. Now, the next decision by the World Health Organization was called Operation Cat Drop, where they parachuted cats into Borneo, launched actually from an airbase here in Singapore, and they parachuted cats in to decrease the population of the rats. It's a classic example of linear thinking and making decisions for the now that actually we don't think about the unintended consequences. And in agriculture, 
we make these kind of decisions all the time. So there's lots of things to consider in terms of the system in order to make the right decision because the alternative is the unintended consequence. We can have the best intentions in the world, but actually, if we don't embrace the complexity and map the system to find the correct leverage point, the, un at the unintended consequence is inevitable. So when we talk about systems, you know, some things are systems and some things are not. When we look at a flower and a bee and the system, the intricate system that is involved in that, it's important for us to actually understand that actually everything's a system. Whether it's political systems or whether it's a football team. That football team is an intricate web of systems that need to work together in order to achieve a common goal. So we often help people to understand those systems in order for them to understand what those connections are to get to the point that we can actually make better decisions. And in terms of food, I pulled this off and I'll, and I'll share it with you. In terms of rethinking food, this was a good way to actually look at some systems conditions in terms of what might you consider in terms of rethinking food to remake the world. And you can see what they've got in there. They've got ecosystems, governance, cultures, cities, economy, and then the types of things that you might consider to actually make better decisions as it pertains to agriculture and supplying enough food for people of this, earth, of this earth and making sure that people aren't taking or getting more than their fair share so that that food waste is actually contributing to the problem when it actually should be contributing to the solution. So that's just a, a little intriguer to kind of get you thinking because as we actually we actually train people to play systems games to actually see connections and then from those games we have people map out issues in their own community and this would be a good opportunity to map out the anything to do with food, agriculture, food security, whatever it might be to consider the conditions to actually get to better questions. You can notice some of the questions on the right hand side there. Does having a job outweigh the human rights being violated? This is a particular map of uh, a building that was actually built across the street from my school here in terms of, well, what would you need to consider in terms of sustainable development? But you can ask any question you want. I pulled out an example from these are 11-year-olds mapping the disconnection to food of students at this school. So they were concerned that their food consumption and their disconnection from food, they were trying to figure out why that's the case. And they were trying to figure out where the best leverage point was to actually connect people to the food that they consume because they felt not only were they making bad choices for the environment and the way food was growing but they were actually making bad choices for themselves in terms of their own health. So these are 11 year olds mapping out the system and finding the leverage point. These are 7 year olds mapping out a system of online and offline life of where the leverage point could perhaps be. And those are just some examples. In terms of climate change you can do the same thing. You can map out all of, the, all of the causes and effects in terms of the system's conditions to therefore come to better, uh, better decisions. So for me, what I'm advocating for is I'm advocating for the idea that once we understand the system's conditions of sustainability, and it's not just the green team, then we can actually use systems thinking to map all the connections to therefore find where the meaningful leverage points are to therefore make better decisions. And for the world of agriculture and food, I mean, th this kind of process is absolutely necessary so that we can, um, we can make better decisions pertaining to the large issues surrounding it. And that's me. Wonderful. Thank you so much, uh, Mike, for this uh, absolutely amazing presentation. Um, I especially enjoyed your example uh, about Borneo because uh, mm -hmm. I haven't heard about Operation Parachuting Cats. Um, but of course everything uh, that, that you talked about was uh, incredibly interesting uh, and I will definitely uh, look up both Alan Atkinson and Eric uh, Brullo and send uh, 
um, those names uh, along to the students as well. Um, Great. So I have two questions for you, uh, if you have a little bit of time. Yes, I do. And can I mention that if anybody wanted to get in touch with um, Compass Education, the nonprofit that we've started, certainly welcome to ask any questions about that. All those tools came, our tools for tackling sustainability and a sustainable future came from Alan Atkinson, and he essentially gave them to nine of us who are in education globally and said, go change the world with them. Wonderful. So yeah. can we continue using them in the online yes. DWC class then? Absolutely, and I'm happy to provide any further support with that. Okay, that sounds uh, that sounds amazing. That's, sure, that's great news. Um, okay, so I have a controversial question first uh, because okay. you mentioned uh, we should never be bogged down by what's possible, and then I think that you know um, just trying to stay within the range of things that are doable is important. So could you mm -hmm. maybe clarify what what you mean by that, and how is it possible to stay realistic? And um, and kind of grounded in, in in you know reality, and at the same time uh, push change forward. Yeah, that's a tricky one. Um, the key, I think, is that teachers, especially, and those who are trying to tackle sustainability, can really easily get overwhelmed by these really complex issues. And the key is to, I think, is to embrace the complexity. To basically say, yeah, it's, it's, there is no really easy answer. And we've proven that as a human species. We've proven that over and over and over again because we make quick decisions and solutions and then we're absolutely inundated with unintended consequences. All right? And we're seeing that. We're seeing that in climate change. We're seeing that in the agriculture in industry. We're seeing it all over the place. Um, so... It's about keeping that fine line between motivation and knowing that you have the power to actually make decisions to make a change and understanding that, well, you need to do it in a way that's actually meaningful because there's nothing worse than taking action without having the actual skills to do so. So I would recommend to, to any of the students or anybody who's trying to create change, there's really important background that you need to understand how to make change. If you're trying to change an organism you need, or an organization, you need to understand how organizations work. Because you could get really fired up about starting a recycling program at your school, for example. And we've all seen the examples where you're really fired up with a group, and then you go out to implement it, and it and it flops. And you're thinking to yourself, why don't people do this? Why can't they just put the stuff in the box? Why did why did the cleaners at my school throw my box out? You know, there, there's a way to move forward with these kind of things, and what we're advocating for is that once you embrace this complexity and understand how to make connections in these systems, people will have a lot more skills to be able to choose the right leverage point. Because people get frustrated because they choose the wrong leverage point. And if you're going to choose the wrong leverage point over and over again, you may as well put a helmet on, because you're going to hit your head against the wall forever. So, mm -hmm. so that's you know that's kind of my thoughts on how to do that. The motivation, these these big big issues. Watch the Eric Berlow TED Talk, because he yeah. actually tackles um, going into Afghanistan and creating creating a different system in Afghanistan. You want to talk about a complex problem, and he tries mm -hmm. to break it down. How to interject on that? Cool, cool, cool. And uh, yeah, no, I completely, completely am on board with uh, with how you think about this. And I guess like how how I like to think about it is that you know there's like dark green uh, and light green way you look at sustainability and and environment and um, and helping helping the world from that perspective. And uh, the dark green guys are saying, okay, we're facing towards like this apocalyptic world. Nothing is possible. It's too complex. 2017, uh, where everything is going to blow up, we're doomed. And then yep. the light green is like, yes, it's complicated, but we are pretty smart and we will figure it out. We just need to get started and just get uh, get on the things that that we actually can uh, have an impact on. And um, so so that's uh, that's great. However, I do have uh, because you uh, bashed on the recycling uh, project yeah. uh, idea several times. Uh, so I wanted to ask uh, another somewhat controversial question. So if not recycling in the schools, what do you think uh, are the 
the best project that students can actually do to drive change. Because one of the things that the students are doing in this class um, is trying to implement a project in their community uh, that that works and that drives real change, whether it's in terms of awareness or or actual real effects. Yeah, no, I, and it's not that I'm bashing on recycling programs. I think people often believe that sustainability is about the green movement, mm -hmm. and what I'm advocating for is there's much more to it. Because if you actually don't consider the other systems conditions, you are not going to be successful, and you're going to turn other people off. I think recycling, obviously, reduce, reuse, recycle. We all know that reduce is the king of those three, and that's actually the one that's going to have a much greater impact. Okay, so but recycling also helps, so it's good. But the the question being, if you're going to if you got to find out whether recycling in your system is the biggest leverage point. And if it is the biggest leverage point, what are you going to do next? Because it's all about that plan of what comes next. If, if, for example, you know that recycling is going to have a positive impact on the sustainability of your community, great, go for it. But then the plan has to be in place in terms of how you're going to implement that. And too often that implementation phase, again, you go out into the greater community and they don't have the same understanding that you do. So they're not motivated. So the way that we talk about it in terms of using tools to do that, I'm wondering if anybody who's watching this live or anybody who is, is going to watch this later uses things like the iceberg model. Okay? So the iceberg model, something you're going to want to look up. Your, the iceberg model, what it does is what you see above the surface in an iceberg is a very small portion of the iceberg itself. Okay, And there's lots of places you can find this out there on the web. So what we often do as human beings is we see what's above the water. So in terms of recycling, we see events and outcomes. Okay, And so we react to those events and outcomes. But actually what you need to do is you need to go below the surface. And when you actually go below the surface, you're going to find that once you figure out the behavior, the patterns of behavior of the people in the system, go one deeper and figure out how the systems work and the patterns, go one deeper and figure out people's mental model. Because oftentimes it's people's mental model that you need to change, not the event or the outcome. And I know anybody who's listened to this who's tried to put something in place um, give you an example. Students on this campus tried to um, start a campaign of making sure students put their dishes away in the canteen because they were being slobs. I don't know, it, like this happens in schools all over the place. But it could be the same as an example for recycling. So at first, what did they do? Okay, let's put up signs to put your plates back. Let's put more teachers on duty. Let's have a, an assembly about it. Um, all those things are above the surface of the iceberg. You're reacting to the events. When they actually did some systems thinking and made some connections and patterns of behavior of who's involved in the system, they actually got to the mental model for the solution. So here's what they figured out. They figured out that the students at the school, everywhere else in their life, they have a nanny or a helper who cleans up after them. So why would they do it at school? It's a habit. So telling them to do it, and it isn't, that's not going to do a thing. So actually the action plan and the leverage that they came up with on that, on that key issue, they ran workshops with parents at coffee mornings that were already existing to essentially, and I'll put it crudely, but they put it much nicer, to essentially tell parents, you are teaching your kids and you're enabling them to be slobs because you let your helper clean up after them all the time. And what's going to happen to them when they don't have a helper? Then what? And they did it in a much nicer way, right? They, they ran these workshops, and it had a tremendous impact on these families who attended. They all of a sudden had this mental model shift. They had this cognitive shift where they went, oh, my goodness, I'm enabling that. That's, that's the kind of ideas that were get below the surface, get below the surface, get below the surface. Let me very quickly show you a slide here that will give you the encouragement all right, to say, actually, you know what? Don't get bogged down. Here you go.
because the work that you are doing, okay, the work that all these students are doing, it's so very important, the work that you are doing. And in the end of the day, you're creating a better world by what you're doing. Um, it's just about considering the system, getting below the surface, and choosing that leverage point that is going to be the best choice. Is it going to be perfect? No. Are you still going to have some unintended consequences? Yes. And you react to those. But those are the considerations. Amazing. Thank you so much. And I think that, uh, that what you have just ended with ties really nicely with the, another lecture that we will have this week um, with a company called Fruta Peya, yes. um, who actually uh, are one of the coolest initiatives, I think, to uh, fight with, um, with waste of uh, food products. Because what they realize that it's not uh, as much me and you buying too much uh, food and then leaving it in your fridge, though that, of course, is also important. But it's uh, companies and supermarkets that do not want to buy fruit that does not look pretty. Um, yes. and, uh, and they actually organized a system uh, in which people can buy directly from farmers, kind of irrespective of the visual quality of the of the food, and actually get really nice discounts to um, to also uh, kind of improve their their livelihoods and be able to afford more fruit and vegetables, which is good for their well-being. So I think that it really nicely fits into this framework that you have just described. Absolutely, um, and and the big you know that that is a perfect example of mental models. The idea that someone would walk into uh, would walk into a grocery store and not choose something because the way it w looks, when actually, chances are it's got less pesticides and less things on it, right? It's because they don't they don't know that. So yeah. that's great. That's a great example of getting to the mental model. Yes. So thank you so much for your amazing presentation. Uh, I am sure that all of the students in the uh, APAC, EMEA, and the Americas group are going to love it. Um, and is it okay if they have any further questions? If I email you directly and see whether uh, whether you're able to respond to any questions that, that they might have afterwards. No problem at all. My own life's mission is I think the world is going to change through this kind of education. So I'm happy to support. Wonderful. Thank you so much, and um, yes, we'll definitely be in touch about education resources and, uh, and teaching sustainable development. Bye-bye. Um, okay. It was a pleasure to listen to you. Take, bye. take care, everybody. Bye.